Welcome back to the podcast, Unbinding the Bible. Today's episode is another by the book episode. And several weeks ago, on April 23rd, actually, of this year, I released a by the book introductory episode. It was a rather short episode, but the purpose of which was to insert various books in my life that have had a tremendous impact on me as both a Christian, but also as an interpreter of the Bible. And I've been able to release um, several of these already, just conversations I have had with authors whose books have impacted me. And today I have another book, but this one is going to be particularly unique to the series in Revelation that we've been in for quite some time now. And you have heard me reference the book Reading Revelation Responsibly by Dr. Michael Gorman. And in recent weeks, even the Bible Project podcast has brought this book up as an outstanding resource that even they recognize is something that needs to be studied because Dr. Gorman has um, some great insights to offer us in rightly interpreting the book, or as his title says, reading it responsibly. And so this past Friday, Juneteenth of this year, I was able to sit down and have a conversation with Dr. Gorman about this very book, a book that has had a profound impact on me and many of the things that I have been sharing with you throughout the podcast. Many of them have come from my understanding of what Dr. Gorman sees when he reads the book, as well as through some of the work he's done in the study of Paul with Cruciformity and actually a book he's written by that same title that is now nearly 20 years old. And so Dr. Gorman and I talk about both his books, Cruciformity, as well as reading Revelation responsibly. But I'm excited just to offer you the hour-long conversation we had where we talk about the state of the church. We talk about the church's desire for power. And we talk about the dangers of civil religion, what that is and why we need to guard ourselves against it. And what you'll hear in this conversation is Dr. Gorman's soft tone, his pastoral heart, but his immense wisdom and insight into the scriptures that I think is both valuable for the church, but also is is life transforming for those who take the time to listen intently to what he is saying and invite Jesus to do a powerful work in our hearts, both individually as well as communally as, as churches. And so I commend to you this episode by the book, A Conversation with Michael Gorman. Welcome back to the podcast, Unbinding the Bible listeners. Today on the show, we have another By the Book episode, and today is with Dr. Michael Gorman. And Dr. Gorman holds the Raymond E. Brown Chair in Biblical Studies and Theology at St. Mary's Seminary and University in Baltimore, Maryland, where he has been a professor since 1991. Mike is the author of nearly 20 books and scores of articles, including several books on Paul, books on Revelation, the Gospel of John, and the Atonement, volumes on biblical interpretation, and books on topics in Christian ethics. Mike is married to his high school sweetheart, Nancy, and they have three adult children. And Mike, it's just a really great uh, privilege to have you on the show today. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me, Joshua. I appreciate it. Yeah. Well, um, many of you listeners may even recognize Dr. Gorman by name. I have referenced his book several times through our Revelation series on the podcast, and his book entitled Reading Revelation Responsibly, Uncivil Worship and Witness, Following the Lamb into the New Creation. And this book was written by Dr. Gorman almost 10 years ago, and... um, Mm -hmm. I, uh, I just wanted to pull, pull one quote out. It's, it's almost a little lengthier subtitle to the book than what Dr. <laughs> Gorman was able to put on the front cover, but it comes from page 77 in his book, and it says, Uncivil worship and witness following the lamb out of fallen Babylon into the new creation. And I really think that that's a fitting, a fitting longer subtitle there. Um, so if we could just dive right in, Dr. Gorman, can you just um, tell us a little bit about yourself? And then I'd love to hear some of the things at work in your own life or through your own study that led you um, into studying Paul, uh, cruciformity mm-hmm. and other such things, and then how that eventually shaped the way that you approach a book like Revelation. Can you just yeah. share those things with us? 
Sure, thanks. Well, as you mentioned, I have been uh, teaching at St. Mary's Seminary and University since 1991. It's the oldest Catholic seminary in the United States and the only one in the world, as far as we know, that has an ecumenical graduate school within it. So there are sort of two divisions in one. And I've been privileged to now start my 30th year this fall, which is kind of hard to believe. Um, I'm a native of Maryland, so um, it's nice to be able to to come back to that uh, space when you're in a field like I'm in because there aren't that many jobs and there aren't that many places to 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 be a New Testament scholar in the state of Maryland. So I'm very happy to be here. Um, other than that, so I my wife and I have been part of a Methodist church the entire time we've lived here. I became a believer through a Methodist church many, many years ago and then kind of walked through some various incarnations of the faith in other traditions and ended up uh, back here partly due to the influence of Stanley Hauerwas, my friend of many years, and partly due to the fact that when we moved back here, this was the church down, down the street, and we like to be sort of in the neighborhood. Um, I, I, I'm privileged to have three children who, who have all followed the Lord, and uh, two of them are pastors. One of them has been a church staff member and also has been my teaching assistant for the last uh, year and a half or so. So, um, yeah, so I, I mean, that's probably enough about me for, for right now. Um, how did I get into all this? I guess it's interesting. I probably began my interest in Paul when I was a teaching assistant myself in college and didn't realize I was getting beginning to get hooked on Paul and had had a couple of courses where I had a great papers and, and then I had a, an exegesis um, seminar that included some work on Paul. But I put Paul on the back burner for a couple of years and then got in, interested in Paul in, in graduate school. But it was in graduate school at Princeton that I not only encountered Paul in an academic way, but also the book of Revelation. I had been, like many people who grew up in my era, um, influenced, not in a positive way, but uh, unavoidably influenced by Hal Lindsey and the late great planet Earth. So I was scared out of, of my blue jeans in, in, a, <laughs> in high school about the end of the world and the book of Revelation. But when I went to Princeton, uh, Bruce Metzger, who was my advisor and mentor, had a, a course on Revelation, which I was privileged to take and then to TA with him for. So that's that's kind of how my interest in Revelation took on an academic spin. And, and this book came out of that, wanting to write a book for people to read about Revelation that wasn't in the Hal Lindsey or um, Tim LaHaye kind of uh, genre or vein. But my interest in Paul and this do dovetail, as you as you hinted, Joshua, um, the my reading of Paul very much focused from the beginning of my um, uh, PhD dissertation and even before that on Christ's self-emptying on the on the foundational <clears throat> reality of the cross, both for our salvation and also for our way of life. So cruciformity, even though I didn't use this term back in the um, early '80s or mid '80s. Uh, cruciformity was already on my mind, and I began to see that as a lens through which to read the entire New Testament, including the book of Revelation, so that when we get to Revelation, the slaughtered lamb who is standing, the resurrected one, becomes the lens through which I think we need to read the book of Revelation in much the same way that the exalted, crucified Lord Jesus of Philippians 2 is the lens through which we need to read the entire Pauline corpus. So, there is a connection between those two, and I've gone on this first question way too long, but let, let me pause there and let you come back. No, you would not go on way too long. Um, I am imagining in my mind that there are a handful of listeners to my podcast. Um, one of the things that I've shared with my listeners before is that I enjoy reading books like the one you've written as well as other scholars, but I surround myself a lot with church members and Christians who don't either have the time or the energy to try to plow through big works like that. And so sure. I've shared it a number of times that I enjoy doing that as a, I think God's given me the desire for that. But I, I like to take what I read then and try to hand it to others who might not, um, you know, be swimming in this world of, of academia. So sure. what I'd love to do for you, if you would, would you give us, I mean, I know to say a summary of cruciformity, but could you could you define that word and then could you just take take as long as you want but to just set up someone who may have never heard of this idea 
what are you talking about when you say, you know, how everything centers on the self-emptying of Jesus on the cross? Sure. Well, the, the word cruciformity is a noun form, obviously, of the adjective cruciform, which simply means cross-shaped. It's originally an architectural term used to talk about churches and especially cathedrals that were built in the Middle Ages and are still built to this day in the shape of a cross. So a cruciform architectural plan, if you will, is, is how most uh, medieval cathedrals and other churches were, uh, were laid out. So cruciform simply means cross-shaped. The noun means taken in a kind of figurative way. Cruciformity means uh, a cross-shaped way of life or cross-shaped existence. What I like to say sometimes is most Christians understand that the cross is the basis of our salvation. What the New Testament wants us to understand also is that the cross is the shape of our salvation, how we live it out. So that's, that's a kind of basic understanding. What does that mean in practical terms or even in, in sort of extended terms, not necessarily talking about daily practicalities at, at the moment, at least not yet, but um, what would it mean to understand Jesus' own death on the cross as embodying what Paul says are the three, what we can now call three theological virtues, faith, hope, and love. So Christ on the cross was faithful, in that sense of faith-filled, faithful to God, obedient to God and to death, as Paul says in Philippians 2. He was at the same time loving us, uh, expressing his undying love through his self-giving and, and dying, literally dying love. And he was uh, creating a, a pattern of humiliation and, and suffering followed by exaltation and resurrection that's begun in the Old Testament as the way of the people of God and now comes to fruition in his own life, Jesus' own life, as the way of hope, the way of, of, of moving from humiliation to exaltation, from suffering to death. Uh, so those three, if you will, theological virtues that Paul seems to have coined, faith, hope, and love, become ways of understanding how cruciformity works itself out in everyday life. So it's about self-giving uh, faithfulness to God, self-giving love for others, and especially um, uh, emptying ourselves like Christ did of his status and his rights to, uh, to act in, in love for the good of others rather than for our own self-interest. And then to do that in a spirit of, of hope that there's a, a way in which that is recognized by God and, and moves, who moves us from, uh, from death to resurrection, from humiliation to exaltation. Lots of other things that could be said about that, but I think that might be a good a good starting point. So it really has a lot to do with everyday life. It's not a it's not simply a theological you know, attitude or or or, or platitude. It, it really has to do with everyday life. Yeah, well, and that's what I think has been so helpful as I've read your book, particularly both of your books, Cruciformity and Reading Revelation Responsibly, is that the cross isn't just a platitude. It, it's not just a, a stated belief. It's something, and I think you use the word embodied. Mm -hmm. it, it's supposed to be embodied. But I, I guess here's my, here's a question I've pondered, and I don't have the answer to it, and I don't expect that you do either, but maybe you have some thoughts. Um, I've grown up in the church but I've never looked at the New Testament quite like that. Um, I have been in recent years, but I'm I'm in my early 40s, so I would say for you know 30 plus years I've gone to church and listened to messages. But to see this truly embodied cruciformity as a way of life, not just as a stated belief system, um, are you familiar with contexts in churches where Christians don't grasp this? And if so, what are some of the reasons why? This is uh, hitting me in my 40s. <laughs> hmm. Well, you may not be giving yourself enough credit, Joshua, because I think most Christians recognize, even if they don't use the language, they recognize the, um, the reality that there's a theme throughout the teachings of Jesus, the example of Jesus, the teachings of Paul and other New Testament writers that... Jesus' own self-giving sacrificial love is, is at least 
in some, in, in addition to other things, it's the model for our own lives. Um, very few Christians would would doubt that and would or deny that. Uh, so you have, um, you know, a book like Bonhoeffer's Cost of Discipleship, written in, written in the '30s, that kind of woke the church up to say, um, "There's a cost. There's a there's a an element of discipleship that's that is costly. It is the sort of the substance of." Discipleship is taking up your cross and following Jesus. I, I doubt that most Christians would deny that, but I think part of the problem is um, there are other things that preoccupy Christians, whether it's social issues or doctrinal debates or you know worship wars or whatever. People get hung up on on things that may be secondary and and can lose sight of the some of the primary things that we ought to be focusing on. But having said that, I would want to emphasize that I, I don't think most people would deny what, what I'm saying. They just may not have unpacked it as, as fully uh, as I think the New Testament does. And, and related to that, um, as you mentioned, I wrote a book on the atonement some years ago, which tried to offer a new model of the atonement. And part of that model was saying, we Christians sometimes get hung up on the mechanics of the atonement. Did Jesus substitute for us? Did he conquer evil? Did he, you know, set an example? And the answer to all those is yes, but that's not all there is. And so we get hung up on the mechanics of what exactly transpired either between Jesus and us or between God and Jesus or whatever. And my point is that the point of the cross is yes, to use a metaphor to redeem us, but also to reshape us. And uh, that's why I said earlier, the cross is not only the source of our salvation, but the shape of it. Yeah. Well, and I wonder from your perspective, um, you have in the book of Revelation or in your book, reading Revelation responsibly, you have what you continually refer to as the central and centering vision. And that's Revelation chapters four and five. Mm -hmm. And we see the one seated on the throne and sharing that space with the one seated on the throne is the slaughtered lamb. So I wonder, in your study of Revelation and of Paul, I'm curious, which one did you stumble into first, and which one influenced your understanding of the other, or did it sort of happen at the same time? This sounds like a chicken and egg question. <laughs> <laughs> um I'm guessing, even though my general approach to Revelation was shaped in the in the course of studying with and and then teaching with Dr. Bruce Metzger at Princeton, I think my interpretation of Paul is really what led me to have a second look at the um, Book of Revelation from the perspective that we actually see in in my published work. And I've also written a few articles on the book of Revelation uh, in, in scholarly venues. But um, I think Paul's vision probably captured me with respect to the centrality of the cross before I reread Revelation in that regard. I do want to say, however, I've already mentioned Bonhoeffer and Cost of Discipleship. When I was about 18 or 19 years old, our youth leader, who was sort of our summer college pastor, got us uh, as a group of uh, maybe a dozen of us to read The Cost of Discipleship, I think, between our freshman year in college and sophomore year in college, I think. And then I took a course on the life and teachings of Jesus at my college, and one of the texts in the course was The Cost of Discipleship. The real title of that book is simply Discipleship, not Bonhoeffer's book. And... Um, that book had a major influence on me. So the subtext of probably everything I've said and done is is, is Bonhoeffer's discipleship work, uh, which most, again, most people don't, even if they've read that book, sometimes they don't read the whole thing. They think it's mostly about the teachings of Jesus. Well, that's the first half of the book. The second half of the book is about Bonhoeffer's interpretation of Paul. So you have Jesus and Paul in, in, in a nutshell in, in that very important book. So... Um, I would say Bonhoeffer, Jesus, Paul, Revelation. <laughs> well, that's great. And I've read The Cost of Discipleship, and it's outstanding, and it sometimes very hard to read because he does not pull any punches. He, he does not mince words, that's for nope. sure. He is right in your face. And I think 
that 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 I think your book, if I can commend you on that, I mean your book is also right in your face. Um, it doesn't doesn't mince any words. And and if I could, I know this might sound strange to you, but I'd like to just read a quote from your book, sure. Because I think this this one s- stood out to me as did many of them. But on page one eleven, so kind of right in the center, you say. In his exaltation, Jesus remains the lamb, the crucified one. He participates in God's identity and reign, making him worthy of worship as the slaughtered lamb and only as such. This is the consistent witness of the New Testament that the exalted Lord remains the crucified Jesus. John 20 and Galatians chapter 2. And this one is the true face of God. When this reading is neglected or forgotten, Trouble follows swiftly. Mm -hmm. Any reading of Revelation and any practice of theology more generally that forgets this central New Testament truth is theologically problematic, even dangerous from its very inception. It is doomed not to failure, but to success. And that is its inherent defect. Human beings, even apparently faithful Christians, too often want an almighty deity who will rule the universe with power preferably on their terms and with force when necessary. <laughs> um, any thoughts you would like to add to, to that statement right there? I feel awkward commenting on your own writing, but... but No, um, don't feel awkward. It, it happens to be one of those passages that I have started in my own copy, so <laughs> you, picked a, you picked a good passage. <laughs> well, I, I guess I'll say a couple of things about it. If, if I had to retake anything I said a few minutes ago about people understanding some of these concepts without necessarily articulating them or fully understanding them, the one thing I think that my work on, on the New Testament, and not just my work, but since we're talking about that, um, the, my work on the New Testament emphasizes that many Christians miss is this idea of the fourth element of besides faith, hope, and love that I talk about in cruciformity is power. What is what is power for the New Testament? What is power for Jesus, for Paul? And that has to do with their presentation of God. So what Christians, besides not understanding that the cross is, in addition to being the source of our salvation, also its shape, unfortunately, many Christians don't understand that the source, I mean, the, that the cross is not only a revelation of Jesus, but a revelation of God. So here we see the fullness of God, as Colossians puts it, on display. And and if that's the case, then God is a very different kind of deity from the deities that we find in ancient Greece and Rome and, and that we find in, in North America, where we, we feel like God is on our side in, in some issue or some even some battle some literal or even figurative battle that god is this god of of um amazing power to overcome and overtake and and defeat enemies and yeah that's all true except that the new testament says that god does that through the power of the cross through crucifixion through vulnerability through self-giving love not through um the power of the sword, not through the power of secular um, po- political might. And what unfortunately often happens in Christian circles is that we, I'll, I'll say we, we marry some kind of power, especially political power, to Christianity and we call it, um, you know, we call it God and country, or we call it uh, Christian nation, or we call it lots of different things. And that's what this paragraph that you just read from, or two paragraphs, was getting at, that if we forget that God's self-revelation is in the self-giving, life-giving death of Jesus, we will misunderstand the notion of not only of power and of salvation, but the very notion of God that's in the New Testament. Yes. Well, and here I, I, you spent a decent portion of time in chapter 3 talking about, very specifically about civil religion. Um, and you talk about nationalism or militarism mm-hmm. or, you know, opportunities for the church to really stop and think. Um, I, I liked how you're setting it up here. You're identifying it as our ideas of power. Um 
can you talk to us a, l- a little bit more about um, how do you see the church today um, eagerly maybe grasping for a different definition of power than the one that we see the New Testament outlining with Jesus on the cross? Yeah. Well, as you said, I have really the whole book, but especially chapter three of reading Revelation responsibly is devoted to that. And when you said I don't mince words, this is probably the chapter that got me in the most trouble when it was in draft form and has gotten me in the most trouble uh, since its publication. But I but I stand by every idea, probably every word of what I wrote, and even perhaps more so now. So I define civil religion as the attribution of, of sacred worth and sacred status to, to secular power. And and what flows from that is a, uh, something that requires, asks and even requires uh, almost unchecked allegiance, obedience, um, participation in rituals. And a lot of this in, in our own country and in, in most countries where it takes place, and it does take place in many countries, a lot of it is, is um, kind of beneath the radar screen. We don't, we're, it's, we're so used to it, we're not aware of it. So for instance, just to take one controversial example, uh, how many kids in this country get up every morning, 180 days a year, from kindergarten through grade 12 and say the Pledge of Allegiance? It's a lot of times to repeat what is basically um, a piece of civil religion. It's, it's connecting God and, and human um, allegiance and, and a political power um, in a way that fosters uh, uh, an unquestioning uh, commitment to a political state that in many cases ends up challenging the first allegiance that we ought to all have, which is to God through Christ. So... Um, what I do in the book is show the similarities between the civil religion of the Roman Empire and its claims on people and its, and its theological or ideological claims and the way the, those practices and, and um, rituals and positions, if you will, manifest themselves in the United States, since that's where I live and that's where I teach and do my theology. What is so different and so dangerous, however, is not only Roman ideology and Roman theology about the state present in the United States, but it is Christianized. And first glance, people say, well, that's great. We've now made it Christian, but that's the problem because it is fundamentally flawed to think that God is manifesting power and um, control of the world through secular political realities and instead of through the crucified and resurrected Jesus, the, the kingdom of God, and so forth. Um, so there's a kind of syncretism that emerges. And we think we're talking about a patriotic God and country motif. And before we know it, we have morphed um, allegiance to Jesus Christ into allegiance to the powers that be, the secular powers that be. And um, that's what that chapter, and in, in, in some ways, based on the subtitle you read, that's what this book is trying to counter, that we, we need to question that. And many people can't even realize that it's there, much less question it. Yeah, and I think you're right. Many people don't even realize it's there, much less question it. And I think throughout you've spoken about idolatries and things that are embedded um, in the heart. So what kind of, what kind of pushback, just curiously, um, did you receive when you were just blunt with what you've written in this particular chapter? Well, I have to say that this book has been um, very well received as, as a whole. And even this angle, if you will, in this particular chapter have been generally well received. So I haven't received a lot of negative feedback about the book, but what ha- what negative feedback I have received or pushback, as you said it, um, has been the what what some people at least see as overly critical of some practices that seem either appropriate or harmless or even perhaps sanctioned by um, the New Testament or by the church. 
And my response to that is when you take this as a whole package, and by this I mean the various elements that I describe in chapter three, sacred language, sacred rituals, um, holy days, if you will. I, I, I like to refer to the time period that began with the memorial date until Thanksgiving as this kind of secular sacred season. You know, we, we honor everything American from Memorial Day to Thanksgiving. And then we get a six-month reprieve from Advent to Easter or, or Pentecost, sometimes a little less than six months. Um, but there's so much to this package deal that, that I, I listed at length in chapter three that before you know it, if you start thinking about it, it's everywhere. It's sort of like the air we breathe. And and the air you breathe, you don't notice until you can't breathe it or until, you know, you get put on a, a ventilator and somebody says, wow, look what you have been. Um, now, that you, now that you think about breathing, look what you have been doing. Look what you have been taking for granted. And I think it's the same way with civil religion. We do it so much we being Americans, we being people uh, again, of faith in, in America, we do it so much we don't even realize we're doing it until somebody sits back and says, yeah, look at this, bang, 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 bang. And now maybe it's time to, to question some of these things. And when you start questioning one, it's like a domino effect. Before you know it, the whole structure begins to uh, look problematic. Yeah, that's right. And um, if I could read just another sentence or two from uh, page 56, so still in that chapter three there. You mm -hmm. wrote that, I would contend that the most alluring and dangerous deity in the United States is the omnipresent syncretistic god of nationalism mixed with Christianity light, religious beliefs, language, and practices that are superficially Christian but infused with national myths and habits. Sadly, most of this civil religion's practitioners belong to Christian churches, which is precisely why Revelation is addressed to the seven churches, not to Babylon, mm -hmm. to all Christians tempted by the civil cult. And so I, I think maybe if you could speak to that, that was a really powerful insight the first time I read it. It wasn't that I didn't realize that, but yeah, the book of Revelation is written to the church. And I think what, what really rubbed me strange, having also grown up with the Left Behind series idea mm -hmm. of, the rap, of the rapture that takes place somehow between chapters three and four and the church <clears throat> is no longer present, this whole thing, right. is that it, it actually removes the exhortation to the, <laughs> to the churches. Um, but can you talk about that a little bit, how, how the New Testament, but even Revelation here, is addressed to the church and what then is the main reason we're receiving all these visions as a church? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think you hit the nail on the head in terms of misunderstanding the book of revelation. Many people, most people who read revelation without any guidance think and, and assume it is about predicting the end of the world. It's addressed to um, either if you believe in the rapture that the church is, primarily gone and so this is a book depicting what's going to happen after the rapture and or you um, think it's a book that predicts the so-called end times and the coming of the antichrist and uh, whatever other images people have by the way your listeners maybe know this and the word antichrist doesn't even appear in the book of revelation now there's certainly an <laughs> antichrist figure but it's kind of interesting that we talk about the antichrist and in, in the book of revelation when the term isn't even there uh, but the New Testament books from Matthew to Revelation were written to churches. And if we don't realize that the book of Revelation is written as a challenge to the first century churches in Asia Minor, which is Western Turkey today, and since there's seven of them, I think we can assume that John would be happy for all the churches then and now to hear this book. Um, if we leave that out and we, we forget that's its purpose, its, its focus, then we can move away from the centering vision of the slaughtered and, and standing lamb. We can move away from the call to get out of Babylon as a call to the church. This is resistance literature. So, so 
the church is being called to resist this civil religion that the Roman Empire says God is on our side. God has put the political powers in place, and we have maintained and expanded that that rule by virtue of of the sacred mission of war, of sacred violence, and we've and we've maintained it by having people pledge their allegiance to the the gods that have put us in power and the and the powers that have been put in power by those gods, namely especially the emperor. And this is what we do to, to live and to survive. Well, that's one way of living. And to resist that can be costly. Uh, back to Bonhoeffer, it was obviously costly to him. It's easy yeah. to, to take a Bonhoeffer or, or a Nazi Germany and say, yeah, that's, that's sort of the, that's obvious when it's so extreme, but it wasn't obvious. There were many Christians who were on the Nazi uh, payroll, so to speak, or, or supporting Nazis, even theologians and biblical scholars, unfortunately, church folk. So here we have, if you will, a, a manifesto, a call to resist this kind of um, political civil religion. And I think that call is just as pertinent in, in our own context as it was in the first century. Oh, for sure. And and that's what it seems that it's uh, becoming that more apparent the, the longer we we yeah. live. So, uh, you know, you, you had written, I guess this is a way to do it, but your chapter, I think it's your chapter four called How Do We Read It? Um, interpreting Revelation, which mm -hmm. was a great, a great chapter. And you, um, I'm not sure if you know about the Bible Project. Are you oh, familiar yeah. with that? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So just recently, uh, Tim and John published their conversations that they were having about apocalyptic literature. And I'm not sure if you know this, but they they cited your book um, and held it up pretty highly to all of their audience, which I found pretty pretty remarkable, especially in light of you and I setting this conversation up yeah. months ago. Um, I did. I your... didn't. I didn't see that, but one of my students told me. I recently. I've just. I'm in the near the end of a course. This summer, and, and just for fun, I showed the Bible Project um, introduction to Philippians, which is also largely indebted to, to my work on Philippians. So I, I know the project well, and uh, but, I, but one of my students had told me they had just seen that Revelation reference or heard it. Yes, and it was very well done, and Tim spent some time trying to explain the chart that you have on page 64 of your mm. book where you try to give people – kind of a bird's eye view of the best ways of approaching it or, or the ways certain people do approach it. Um, and Tim had shared on there helpfully saying it's, it's good to know these various perspectives. So when you are engaging other people, you can be somewhat charitable with them and how they've come to understand it. But yeah. would you, would you take a little bit of time? How, how would you explain what you were trying to get across on that chart? Sure. Just before that, though, since you used that word charitable, I, I do want to say some years ago I was part of a, a conference of, of major interpreters of the New Testament on the book of Revelation down at Duke Divinity School. And Tom Wright was there and Richard Hayes and Marianne Mai Thompson and some other people that um, names people may know and some they don't from – we had a couple of scholars from Germany. And so anyhow, um, I, I was the first paper of the conference and uh, the – the paper that I gave said, "Let's be careful here. Those who um, th those who should throw stones are pretty pretty few and far between. I think we have to realize it's this is a hard book to interpret, and we've all made mistakes with it over the years. And to be charitable to those who read it differently is um, a good thing, and 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 a hard thing to do. We have to." Um, let those who are without guilt pick up the first stone, so to speak. Having said that, I'll um, admit I don't have everything under control and, and never will. But what I'm trying to say in, uh, since people don't have access to that chart, I'll, I'll try to explain it, that there's sort of two basic ways of reading a text like Revelation, which is many people have said, and I, I agree, is more like a series of political cartoons than it is of an advanced videotape of the end of the world. And political cartoons, of course, always have exaggeration. They always have political points, and they have to be read um, in context. But when, when, we, when we look at the book of Revelation, many people try to, uh, at one end of the spectrum, try to decode it. 
and they think of this as a as a text that is um, a point for point and item for item to be discerned, figured out. So who is the Antichrist? 666, that must refer to Ronald Wilson Reagan because his first name had six letters and his second name had six letters and his last name had six letters. No, no, no. It refers to Adolf Hitler because of this reason, or it refers to the Pope for, you know, for this reason. So that kind of decoding of everything, um, whether you're focusing on the present. So you, you have a, a COVID virus and you go, go to uh, Revelation chapter six and you say, oh, it's the plague, it's the green horse or whatever. So this decoding approach, but another approach at the f a different end of the spectrum, so to speak, is to see the book of Revelation as a lens through which to read the past, the present, and even the future. So it, 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 it takes on a role of helping us to engage similarities, to recognize similarities and analogies in order to not say X is Y, but to say, hmm, Y looks like X, and therefore, we need to be careful that we don't make the same mistake that the people that saw X did, for example. A number of significant theologians in the last couple of weeks have said, when Donald Trump walked across and, and put himself in front of St. John's Church with holding up a Bible, that that was reminiscent of scenes in the Bible of the defacing of sacred temple space by people like Antiochus Epiphanes or the uh, figure described in Second Thessalonians or the kind of thing we see in Revelation 13. Now, I'm not here to, to, to bash President Trump, that's not my goal, but it's that kind of, not saying that you know, so-and-so let's say Donald Trump is the Antichrist, but to say that something that that president did is similar to and activities we see in the Bible and particularly here in the book of Revelation. How do we interpret that act as a political mistake because it's fundamentally a theological mistake? And um, that's the kind of thing that you say on a podcast that gets you negative feedback. But uh, ah. <laughs> uh, there are a lot of people who, who don't won't, won't agree with that, but I'd encourage them maybe to think about what that could be interpreted as and to see the book of Revelation as a lens of seeing religious figures pointing toward political figures to give them more honor and um, obedience than they deserve. Well, that's in Revelation 13. That's what the second beast does to the first beast. It's not saying that, you know, such and such a religious figure is the second beast and such and such a political figure is the first beast. No, it's to say, let's look carefully at, at political situations in light of, rather than a one for one correspondence, in light of analogies and similarities. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm really glad you, you used that example because I think it's helpful for people who might be unfamiliar with, you know, Revelation or so on. Like, here's something we've seen. How are we understanding this? Um, and if I could use your words to, sure. I think, really tie in what you're, tr what you're actually saying right now. Um, but you said that we've got this lamb-centered, cruciform interpretive strategy or hermeneutic for reading Revelation. Um, and then you use three words. You said we can refer to this approach generally as theopolitical, theopoetic, and pastoral prophetic. And that's really kind of a combination of all three. And then you give a list of a few interpretive approaches. And number three was, this is what you said, abandon the so-called literal linear approaches to the book as if it were history written in advance and use an interpretive strategy of analogy rather than correlation. And then you say, we should therefore be examining our ideologies. Um, you've got, you know, Revelation is image, metaphor, poetry, political cartoon, like you've just said, and it imaginatively reveals the nature of any and all systems that oppose the ways of God in the world, especially as revealed in Christ the Lamb who was slaughtered. And then this is the part I really thought you nailed it, especially as you've 
brought up Antichrist again and how that word doesn't show up in the mm -hmm. book. Mm -hmm. But you said we should therefore be examining our ideologies and isms for manifestations of idolatry and immorality as expressed in imperialism, militarism, nationalism, racism, classism, which is the worship of the corporate self and the degradation of the corporate other, consumerism, and hedonism, the worship of things and pleasure. This means we, we should must probably add racism to that now, right? We should. Well, you had it. It was oh, in okay. There. I didn't hear the list. I don't have the page. Yeah, and I want to talk to you about racism in just a moment as well, if we can. But this means we must especially examine our own Western, Northern American, and even Christian systems and values, not some putative one world government for evidences of that which is Antichrist. And, yeah. you know, again, because Antichrist can also be an ideology, right? We're, we're saying that which is opposed to or against Christ. Exactly. And, um, and, and of course, the way John talks about that in 1 John 4 is that which is opposed to the embodied love of God to the world, which was Jesus come in the flesh. So mm -hmm. there's a, <laughs> there's a, but any, any other thoughts you'd like to say um, in response to your own words there? Well, I think it would be important for, for our listeners to realize that the normal way of, of reading the book of Revelation has spiritual and theological payoff. So if you're looking to identify some future figure, which the church has done often throughout its history, not always, but often, and which many Christians have done, especially if they've been brought up on the Tim LaHaye or... or um, in the earlier years, uh, um, Hal Lindsey type way of reading scripture, which is, by the way, a subset of a, of a larger way of approaching the book that's called dispensationalism, but certain kind of dispensationalism. We won't go into that right now. But my, my point is there's, there's a spiritual danger, first of all, in trying to make this one-to-one -one correspondence and figure out who's being predicted and what events, whether it's you know, the Middle East or whatever. And, and st instead of doing that, to realize this, as we said earlier, this is a book that's addressed to the church to call it out of Babylon, come out. Now, you can't physically leave Babylon. Babylon was Rome, the Roman Empire. Babylon today might be, some people would construe it as the um, world systems of, of uh, all those isms that I mentioned. Uh, some would construe it as particular uh political entities, whether it's uh, the United States or, or communist countries or whatever. So instead of trying to do that, rather to see these, uh, as Paul would put it, cosmic powers that exist, and they always exist, and they're always looking for a new opportunity to manifest themselves in uh, error and evil, human error and human evil are driven, according to the New Testament, by these apocalyptic powers. And they manifest themselves in various ways, but they're not fulfillment of predictions. And it takes careful discernment to figure out when uh, things are being manifested that are contrary to the, the, the power of the crucified Lord. So... There's a lot of spiritual health at risk when we misread and misuse this book. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Um, well, uh, just for listeners, this won't be published today, but on the day right now, today um, is June, June 19th, where right. we're having this conversation yeah. and uh, affectionately known as Juneteenth. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I would just like to ask you, Dr. Gorman, we're obviously in a very very difficult time as a nation. Um, the church, I believe, can be, if we are open to the leading of the Holy Spirit, can be uh, positioned in a particular way to respond appropriately, um, especially where we had a, a very hurting and fractured and um, angry culture around us and, and many of the reasons for which I can see are, are justified. So my, my question for you, just to, to share with us what you think, but what does the book of Revelation have to say about the church's response toward racism, um, especially considering our complicity in and justification 
of racism throughout our history in this country. Mm -hmm. Um, How do we, or does revelation speak to that? What kind of, what kind of words of encouragement would you share with the church? Yeah. I think the most relevant and powerful aspect of the book of revelation that addresses this concern is the vision of the church triumphant that we see in places like revelation seven, revelation 14, where we have a vision of the church of people from every nation, tribe, language, tongue, et cetera, et cetera. And so that becomes the norm for the book of Revelation's understanding of the people of God, of the church. And in addition to that, we have in in the book of uh, Revelation chapters 21 and 22, this vision of the glorious uh, descent of the, of the reign of God to earth and uh, the the river and the trees of healing for for the healing of the nations. So uh, Revelations, if you will, eschatological or end times vision is not about predicting some horrible thing that's going to emerge and take over the world and and, uh, be a threat to Christians. It's, It's about an ongoing reality of othering people and saying, you know, this language or this tribe or this ethnicity or this race doesn't matter to because I'm not it, it's not me, or I'm not them and they're not me. Um, and um, it's it's okay for us as Christians to be sort of myopic and, and even nationalistic to the degree that we want to keep out foreigners from our churches or our country that we happen to live in. So, um, the book of Revelation has this image of the church and this image of the descent of the of the uh, presence of God among humanity in this final way. These these images compel us to live and, and to act and to speak in certain ways in in the moment. So, I mentioned at the very beginning of the conversation that I I teach at St. Mary's Seminary and University in Baltimore, the only Catholic. And I'm not Catholic, by the way, I'm Methodist, only Catholic seminary in the um, world with an ecumenical division. And I'm very proud of the fact that unlike many theological schools, we are a school that is um, racially mixed and racially at at, at one. Um, I'm not saying there's never disagreement, I'm not saying there's never conflict, but there's this beautiful sense of uh, students coming together, if you will, around the Word of God in in a way that um, brings them together. My son is part of a, a multi ethnic uh, church. My students this semester, a lot of them, are, come from one church in which there are whites and blacks and Asians and Africans and Asian Americans. And it's I, and I, I've been to, to worship with them. It's just it's the way the church is meant to be. So if we can. The word I use a lot to talk about embodiment is living exegesis. If we could come, if we as a church could become a living exegesis of Revelation seven, for instance, what a witness that would be! Um, what a challenge it would be! Um, my church, my particular church, isn't there. I'll be the honest. I'll be honest about that. Mm-hmm. Um, many American, many churches in America are not there. But if we could be a living exegesis uh, and and in a in a foretaste of the healing of the nations that would be, and of the races, you know, nations and, and other differences among humans. What a wonderful witness that, to be, that would be to God's purposes for humanity and for us in Christ. Yes. Well, I really appreciate you sharing that because yeah, those are some of the same passages that stand out to me mm-hmm. in Revelation. We are this multicultural people from every tribe and people and language and nation Mm -hmm. and that does by definition challenge um nationalistic or tribalistic or you know my kind of people and and this sort of thing um if we're open to seeing it that way yeah yeah um you had you had shared that you know revelation is really a call to public worship Mm -hmm. a call um to discipleship, which I think the cost of discipleship is a fitting book to bring into this discussion because it's revelation is really calling us uh, to that. And you also put um, 
in, in here in uh, chapter four as well that you said we are in we in the West are now largely like the Laodicean church of mm-hmm. the seven that John is writing to. And many of us then need to read Revelation as such. And I, I think it was Richard Baucom who who said that you can read Revelation almost with seven different pairs of glasses on. You could read it as if you were the Ephesian Christians. You mm-hmm. could read it if you were the church in Smyrna, that sort of thing. And so um, I, my, my last question for you, I think, might tie into that Laodicean, you know, the, the famous lukewarm right. um, passage there. But my last question for you really is, where do you see the church's need today the most from, from what you've written in reading Revelation responsibly? I think that depends a lot on context. I wouldn't say that the church in... Uh, South Africa or this church in Zimbabwe is is more similar to the church in, in Laodicea than perhaps and to other churches uh, in the book of Revelation. But for the Western church, as you, as you rightly quoted from my book, I would say that uh, if we don't learn to abandon this drunken stupor with political power, whether it's power of the left or power of the right, if we don't abandon that and, and return to the power of crucified and resurrected Lord, uh, we are, we are going to, first of all, um, lose our witness, our, our, our cultural witness, and at the same time, probably end up looking like and engaging in the kinds of cultural and political and hope god forbid hopefully not um literal civil um unrest it seems to be percolating just below the surface of the peaceful protests that we see right now i'm I'm very nervous about these militias that have emerged nervous about the uh, uh, very Strong language that comes sometimes close to, to violence, and of course the actual violence that we've seen. So there, there's a lot at stake in, in in this, and the church has got to say, this is who we are, and this is why we are that, and um, we want we want you to to join us. Um, if you're Christian, we want you to join us this way. If you're not Christian, we'd like you to come along for the ride and see what we can be, and um, hopefully you'll you'll see the light. Yeah, that's right. Well, well, Dr. Gorman, this has been a really enjoyable conversation. Thank you so much for agreeing to, to come on and to, to talk with us about your book and about the state of the church. Well, thank you for the kind invitation and to your audience for listening and putting up with uh, some challenging, perhaps challenging uh, ideas and thoughts. That's right. Well, and I listeners, I definitely will put a link in the show notes to Dr. Gorman's book and uh, definitely want you to check out any books that he's written. Um, I've only got my hands on a couple, but I've been so challenged and so encouraged by the things that he said. So again, Dr. Gorman, thank you so much for being on the show and I hope you have a fantastic weekend. Thank you. You too. And to all your listeners. Thanks, Joshua. All righty. Bye-bye. Now, I will plan to put a link to Dr. Gorman's book in the show notes of this episode because this is, in fact, a book that you are going to want to go out and purchase so that you can read from cover to cover because after having a conversation with Dr. Gorman, even for an hour, it's very apparent that we have just barely scratched the surface, not only of what Dr. Gorman covers in his book, but of all the contents that are offered to us in the book of Revelation. And I don't know if you're anything like me, you listen to a conversation like that and think, my goodness, if the book of Revelation isn't probably the most relevant book actually for our times and for our current situation and who and what the church is called to be in the middle of a situation just like this. And I was so so thankful to be able to talk to Dr. Gorman and to ask him some of my own questions But I found that I have basically inserted this now right in the center of the book, 
We have made it through chapter 11. We will begin chapter 12 the following week. And this is, in fact, the second half of the book of Revelation. And so to have a conversation with a scholar on the book itself, right in the heart of our study, I think is just a perfectly fitting way for everything to come together. So I'm thankful for you, listeners. I'm thankful for the chance just to share these conversations with you. And I'm thankful to Dr. Gorman for making it possible. Thanks again to those of you who have left me ratings or reviews or both on whatever podcast app you choose to listen to Unbinding the Bible on. Thank you as well to those of you who are supporting this podcast on a monthly base basis. Your generosity is it's just so kind and very, very humbling. So I appreciate that support in that way. Thank you to those who've reached out via email, unbindingthebible at gmail.com, just to leave a comment or a qu- ask a question or to just share um, if something has been encouraging to you. There may be new listeners to this podcast as a result of just this episode, and I would always encourage you to go back and, and re-listen to some of the episodes that appear at the beginning of this podcast. But if this is new to you or this is your first time listening, welcome. It's nice to have you as a listener on the show. So I hope you all have a great week. Continue to pursue Jesus both in your own lives and your families, in your churches, and in your communities. And I'll talk to you next week.